Hamas are, are a terrorist organization. Their ideology is very clear. Kill everyone, implement a, a, an Islamic caliphate. When we're talking about the Palestinian Authority, the messages, and this cannot be stressed enough, the messages are exactly the same. The, 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 there's no real difference. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Last week, 57 Democratic members of the U.S. House of Representatives signed a letter calling on the U.S. State Department and the FBI to launch an investigation into the death of Shireen Abu Akla, a Palestinian-American journalist who worked for Al Jazeera. Abu Akla died from a gunshot wound suffered during a battle between Israeli forces and Palestinians who were resisting a counterterrorism raid launched in response to the recent wave of attacks in Israel. The letter was worded in accordance with the Palestinian narrative that took it as a given that the reporter was deliberately killed by the Israelis when the facts indicate that it was an unfortunate accident in a combat zone and that the fatal bullet was just as likely to have been fired from a Palestinian weapon than an Israeli one. It was the latest indication of the inroads that anti-Israel propagandists have been making among progressives. While the more extreme members of the Democratic squad are explicitly supporting the Nakba narrative that demands Israel's destruction, other left-wing Democrats are backing this up by supporting different measures aimed at buttressing the big lie about an apartheid state. They're spreading other canards that are make the argument that Israel's measures of self-defense are illegitimate. The goal of efforts like the Abu Akla letter is to undermine the U.S.-Israel alliance by depicting Israel as an oppressor and Palestinians as helpless victims rather than the perpetrators of violence. That a quarter of the Democratic caucus in the House signed on to it shows just how much ground Israel's enemies have gained in the party in recent years. That's the context for what is shaping up as an increasingly bitter fight between those who dub themselves progressives and mainstream pro-Israel groups over the future of the Democratic Party. That battle has been playing out all across the political map in recent weeks as Democratic congressional primaries in which left-wing critics of Israel are facing off against other members of the party who are seen as friendlier to the Jewish state. Pro-Israel political donors and political action committees have been rallying to support of those seeking to prevent the entry into Congress of future squad members. The mainstream pro-Israel lobby, APAC, formed its own PAC last year to help in the effort, joining with others such as the Democratic Majority for Israel, the DMFI. They've had their victories, especially when supporting incumbents like, for example, Representative Chantel Brown of Ohio against left-wing insurgents like Nina Turner, who was national chair for Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign in 2020. Brown beat Turner in a special election in 2021 and again earlier this month, with pro-Israel groups spending heavily on her behalf. But they aren't winning every fight, and one of those determined who is most determined to see the Democrats take a hard left turn is Sanders. Last week, he took particular satisfaction in seeing Summer Lee, another progressive he supports, beat Steve Irwin, a pro-Israel moderate for the Democratic nomination for a Pittsburgh-area congressional seat, despite the efforts of pro-Israel PACs. Lee was also strongly supported by squad leader Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The New York Times depicted that race as evidence that Sanders was preparing for war with AIPAC, as well as proof that he can win it. To that end, he is seeking to get Democrats to reject all super PAC funding. Though there are plenty of left-wing fundraising groups, such a move would hurt pro-Israel groups far more than their opponents. Sanders is a bitter critic of the Jewish state, but doesn't oppose its existence. He told the Times that his confrontations with AIPAC and its moderate allies 
wasn't really about Israel, but because such groups are, as he put it, doing everything they can to destroy the progressive movement in this country. He holds a grudge against DMFI for the way it helped derail his presidential hopes in 2020 in the early primary states when he was temporarily anointed as a front runner until the rest of the Democratic field united behind President Joe Biden. In response, DMFI merely echoes what APAC's goal has been since it began several decades ago, saying that its purpose is to do what it can to ensure bipartisan support for Israel. But though these groups are, contrary to Sanders' statements, not really interested in preventing the Democrats from tilting as far to the left on economic and social issues, it's impossible to separate the party's ideological shift on a wide range of topics from its attitudes towards Israel. The same applies to the troubling manner in which much of the leadership of the Democratic Party has showed itself prepared to accept the mainstreaming of anti-Semitic causes like BDS, even while personally opposing them, in order to avoid an open break with squad stars like AOC and representatives Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. So while Jewish activists say they're not at war with progressives per se, progressive leaders like Sanders and AOC do consider themselves to be at war with the pro-Israel community because APAC is among the principal obstacles to their goal of taking over the party. Over the last half century, the two parties have more or less exchanged identities when it comes to Israel. Republicans have gone from being largely indifferent to Zionism to being nearly unanimous on the issue and a lockstep pro-Israel party. Democrats were once almost uniformly pro-Israel, but are now, as the recent primary battles show, deeply divided over it. Complicating matters is that bipartisanship is out of fashion in both parties. So it wasn't just Sanders and AOC expressing outrage when AIPAC endorsed a slate of pro-Israel Republican incumbents that Democrats were intent on smearing as insurrectionists because of their support to challenges to the 2020 presidential election results. Lately, Democrats have been damning all Republicans and their voters as beyond the pale for their support for pres former President Donald Trump and even somehow to blame for a mass killing in Buffalo last week that was perpetrated by a racist anti-Semitic extremist with a history of mental illness. That means the business of crafting a bipartisan coalition for Israel may be an increasingly impossible task. The stakes involved in this democratic civil war are about more than Sanders' attempt to settle scores or the resentment toward APAC elsewhere on the left. The younger generation of Democrats getting into politics is heavily influenced by fashionable ideologies like critical race theory and intersectionality, which demonize Israel and give a permission slip to anti-Semitism. That means they are far more inclined to side with the left on Israel and other issues, leaving pro-Israel Democrats as increasingly out of touch with their party's base. Despite the wins chalked up by pro-Israel activists in some races, the number of House Democrats who identify as progressives and or want to join the, the squad is growing with each congressional election cycle. That creates a situation where Democratic officeholders are willing to sign on to Palestinian propaganda like the Abu Akla letter, even if they are not yet ready to back Talib and Omar when they promote resolutions predicated on Israel's destruction. It was no small irony that one of the co-sponsors of that letter was Representative Lou Correa of California, who has actually been endorsed by AIPAC. Given the increasing volume of slanders that are tossed at Israel and Jews about apartheid, this also means that anti-Semitic lies are going to be getting a hearing among Democrats, instead of being dismissed, as they should be. As that becomes the norm, the pro-Israel community's worries about preserving bipartisanship will become increasingly irrelevant. As the older generation of septuagenarian Democrats who pay lip service to support for Israel leaves the stage and are replaced by younger people who make no bones about their intersectional ideas, the more important battle will be the one to preserve support for Israel among those who do understand that the progressive movement is a threat to America's future 
as well as to the Jewish state. And now to our interview of the week. The battle that is going on to preserve what's left of a once formidable bipartisan pro-Israel coalition is one in which progressives are planning to win the war in AIPAC and its allies. Evidence that the pro-Israel community is losing ground is being seen in more than the primary results in which left-wingers are beating moderates who are friendly to the Jewish state. The ability of groups that echo Palestinian propaganda, which smears Israel, to get a foothold was demonstrated by the letter signed by 57 House Democrats, asking the State Department and FBI to intervene in the case of a Palestinian Al Jazeera journalist who was recently killed in the crossfire between Israeli defense forces and terror groups. But rather than focus on just the politics, it's important to understand just what the Israel haters are saying and how they are getting their message across. The reason why this more recent smear was able to get so much traction in the mainstream media and even in official Washington circles was the skill and the chutzpah of Palestinian groups in spreading the lies about the Jewish state. Those myths and canards are then recycled all over the media by those predisposed to buy into them by their acceptance of left-wing ideologies like political race theory and intersectionality. In order to better understand how they operate, it's important to realize just how brazen and how despicable the lie to F to at the, and the effort to demonize Israel has become. While the apartheid Israel lies are heard from so-called human rights groups at the United Nations and from so-called progressives in American politics, most of the propaganda starts with the Palestinians and most especially the allegedly moderate Palestinian Authority, rather than the more, its more radical rivals in Hamas and Islamic Jihad. To break this down and how it operates, we're fortunate to have with us today one of the leading experts on Palestinian propaganda and how it works. Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch is the head of legal strategies for Palestinian Media Watch. He's an international law expert who specializes in the prosecution of terrorists, the Palestinian Authority, and the law applied in Judea and Samaria. He was born in South Africa and educated in the United Kingdom, completing his law studies before immigrating to Israel. In the course of his military service, Hirsch served in a number of senior positions in the Military Advocate General's Corps and ultimately as the head of the military prosecution for Judea and Samaria. He's a senior member of Israel's Defense and Securities Forum, a research fellow for the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, which represents victims of terror and is active in promoting anti-terror legislation. Maurice Hirsch, welcome to Top Story. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us today, and thanks for coming on. Um, Maurice, I want to start by asking you to explain a case that you recently wrote about for Palestinian Media Watch that I think sums up the problem with so much of the situation between Israel and the Palestinians. It concerned a Palestinian named Ahmad Banasra, who was convicted of participating in a terrorist attack and who is now, oddly enough, um, the subject of a sympathy campaign being conducted by the Palestinian Authority. Who is he and why does this case matter so much and what does it tell us about the problem? So, so really, we have to give a little bit of a background into who Ahmed Manasra is. Mm -hmm. If you remember, in, 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 in late 2015, um, there was a spike, really, in terrorist attacks taking place. It had been initiated by the Palestinian Authority, again raising the claim that Al-Aqsa, the, the compound of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, was in danger and being threatened by Israel, and that Palestinians should take to the streets and uh, uh, um, and resist that potential or, or alleged uh, uh, um, destruction of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, it came a year after um, the, the kidnapping and murdering of the three boys in Gush Etzion. And so this was really the start of a new terror wave based on if the previous year had been a fight between Israel and Hamas, this was really the PA's Fatah's response. Not mm -hmm. only can Hamas kill 
kidnap and kill uh, uh, Israelis, but Fatah can do it as well. And that's what they did. They launched this terror campaign in sub late September into October 2015. And immediately they sent their main uh, um, group of soldiers into the fight. Who were those soldiers? They're the Palestinian miners that they're so brainwashed into believing that Israel was imminently attacking everyone. Israel was victimizing the Palestinians. And so one of those uh, uh, miners who took place in, in, in these attacks was Ahmed Manasra. Ahmed Manasra went out with his, he at the time was thir just 13 years old. He went out with his 15-year-old cousin um, and they, and they uh, uh, came to, uh, into Jerusalem. And there they found their victims and started chasing after them wildly. Um, they stabbed their, victim, their first victim twice. They then found Naor Ben Ezra, a 12-year-old Israeli, just sitting on his bicycle, doing no harm to anyone. And, they, and, the, and the, the, the terrorist stabbed him four times. Um, Naor is in a terrible state um, until today. But really, immediately, for the Palestinians, they had their perfect victim. Why were the perfect victim? Obviously, Manatsra for them was the perfect victim because his cousin was immediately killed. There were reports that Manatsra himself had been killed as part of the attack. But and 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 immediately, um, Mahmoud Abbas went onto uh, Palestinian television and said that Israel had executed this 13-year-old Palestinian kid for no reason. Um, then Prime Minister Netanyahu took a, a very irregular step and, and allowed television crews into the hospital in Israel where Manasra was being treated. Um, and suddenly uh, 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 Abbas had to obviously recant, but, but the story had already started. They had already made him a, a, a hero. Within a month, the local uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Ramallah schools, under the guidance and auspices of, of, the, of the PA Ministry of Education, had already set up a football contest named after Ahmed Manasra. Now, now what, do, what do you learn as a kid um, when, when you see a football contest named after someone? You, you understand immediately that person is a hero. That person, I want to be like them. I want to be emulate them. I too want to have a football contest named after me. And what do I need to do to do that? All I need to do is try and kill a few Jews. Since then, the, 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 the whole trial process uh, then went on, and, and Ahmed Manatsu was, was initially sentenced to 12 years in prison. The Israel Supreme Court lowered the sentence to nine and a half years because he was nonetheless only 12, 13 years old um, when he carried out the crime. And that's where we're standing. Six and a half years on, um, Manasseh is potentially uh, um, uh, um, coming up for parole, which really, according to Israeli law, should be denied. But there's a whole legal process that's going on. And in the background, the PA has created really an, a tremendously international campaign um, under the hashtag Free Ahmed Manatra. You can look it up. You can see it everywhere. People going crazy to free a terrorist. That, 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 that's the camp campaign. When you call to free Ahmed Manasra, what you're really saying is that it's okay to try and murder Jews because that's what he did. It's not someone who uh, uh, was downtrodden. He, 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 while in prison, he's been paid a tremendous salary uh, um, by the PA. You can't claim that's welfare because when he went into prison, he wasn't financing or, 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 or providing for any of his family. He was a 13-year-old child. The mm -hmm. payments that he's received from the Palestinian Authority are purely and simply a reward for terrorism. And Manasra is the hero. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, what makes this story so important is that the Palestinian Authority that is both paying Manasra and lying, lionizing, you know, his, 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 you know, evil deeds and treating him like a hero is that in the United States, uh, many uh, pro-Israel organizations still treat the Palestinian Authority as sort of a reasonable, more moderate, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the interlocutor um, as opposed to Hamas. And, um, you know, certainly the uh, United States government still treats it as a, a reasonable, more moderate alternative to Hamas. Uh, 
And uh, so the question is, is the Palestinian Authority really capable of making peace? Um, even in the theoretical uh, scenario after Mahmoud Abbas, its current leader, um, leads the scene. So, 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 Jonathan, what we have to understand is when we're talking about peace, there's something different that, or very different, that, that, that we see as the approach to peace and what the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinians see as the approach to peace. And I'm talking only about the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, not about Hamas. Hamas are, are a terrorist organization. Their ideology is very clear. Kill everyone, implement a, a, an Islamic caliphate. When we're talking about the Palestinian Authority, the messages, and this cannot be stressed enough, the messages are exactly the same. The, 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 there's no real difference. The Palestinian Authority from day one uh, depicts Palestine as a geographical area that wipes out Israel's existence. The school books that the Palestinian Authority uses that they only just renewed in 2017 completely expunge Israel's existence. When you ask a Palestinian child what the geographical area of Palestine is, every one of them will be able to tell you from repeated references in the school books that it's 27,000 square kilometers an area that totally expunges Israel's existence. That, that is to say it, that it includes both Israel, Jerusalem, Gaza, and Judea Samaria, the West Bank. That's the area, area that they're talking about, right? It includes everything, as they say in the slogan, from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. Everything is Palestine, from Lebanon in the north to Eilat in the south. Everything is Palestine. There is no Israel. There is no Israel. An Israeli state does not exist for them. Israel is referred to as the, the uh, as the occupation, as the colonizers, as the settlers, as the settler herds. All types of different descriptions. No Israel exists. And when you ask the Palestinians what then the, the 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 next step on to peace is, not only territory. When you discuss the subject of the refugees, for example. The Palestinian Authority says time and time after uh, uh, again that the subject of the Palestinian refugees is non-negotiable. There is no Palestinian leader that has the right to give up, waive the rights of the Palestinian refugees. Every Palestinian refugee must be allowed to come into Israel, all 5.6 million of them, flood Israel uh, and change its demographics, really irrevocably, and to democratically vote Israel out of existence. That's their demand. There is the, 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 the territorial demand is very clear. The demographic demand is very clear. When you add on to it the fact that even the Palestinian Authority religious figures refer to the entire area of Palestine as Islamic Waqf, meaning it's it's an endowment for, 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 for Islam, for, for Muslims. No one has the right, as we publish today, no one has the right to, to sell any part of that land to the enemies, to Israel. Anyone who does so as the, uh, uh, as the, as the, as, 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 uh, as Palestinian Authority leaders uh, um, say is a traitor. Palestinian law um, provides a maximum severance of life in prison with hard labor for selling land. To Jews, that, selling land to Jews, that is. Selling land to Jews. These are the requirements, these are the demands of the Palestinian Authority. Now, you can say that it's just a negotiating tool, but once you've already explained to the Palestinian Authority, or to the Palestinian population, excuse me, for the last 25 years since the Palestinian Authority was created, that these are our un- or, or non-negotiable requirements and demands, which Palestinian leader, even a Palestinian leader that will follow Mahmoud Abbas, would be able to give up on those demands? Who of them is going to say, you know what, we understand that as part of a peace agreement, it is impossible to flood Israel with 5.6, 5.7, uh, 6 million refugees. We're waiving that demand. We, we all know what would happen in Palestinian society to that type of a leader. What type of a leader is now going to say, you know what? We've been telling you for 25 years that all of Palestine, including obviously Israel, is Islamic waqf. But you know what? We made a mistake. 
we can now actually give up on, 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 on that land. When you consider that Palestinian society, very similar to much of the Middle Eastern Islamic community, has been going through a change over the last 20, 25 years as well. Greater Islamization and, 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 and the, the movement, the, the strengthening of Hamas is not necessarily only because of the Palestinians' hatred of, of Fatah and the cronyism and the nepotism that has been so endemic of the Palestinian Authority, but also because of that general movement within uh, 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 Islamic society um, towards, uh, I, 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 I hesitate to say it to a certain extent, but towards fundamentalism, towards fanaticism. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's something which hasn't, definitely hasn't passed over the Palestinian society. Um, and, and, and once you now change that idea and say, well, Islam has changed. This is no longer Islamic waqf. That, that, that's something that just no Palestinian leader will now be able to make that concession. It's something that Mahmoud Abbas, for the, really for the last 17 years, 18 years, has sadly been allowed by, the, by Western leaders to, to really destroy any chance of peace. Not by paying salaries to terrorists, not by uh, rewarding terrorism, not by inciting terrorism, not by glorifying terrorism, but by entrenching the ideas that all of Israel is Islamic waqf and every refugee must return. He has really tied the hands of any future Palestinian leader um, who I fear will never be able to uh, uh, um, obviously realize those goals and will never be able to compromise on them. Yeah, I think that one of the questions that I think um, needs to be answered about this is that, as, as I alluded to before, in the West, the Palestinian Authority still has the moderate tag, um, either by comparison or because people just don't listen to the truth about the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but when you describe the growing radicalization of Palestinian society, which is a reflection of things going on in the broader Muslim and Arab world, is that a reaction to things that Israel is doing? Uh, that's, that's an argument we hear sometimes from the Jewish left. Or is it something that's basically internal in nature? I think it's, 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 I would say that it's almost entirely internal in nature. Um, the, the, the messaging of the Palestinian Authority, the messaging of Hamas to the Palestinians has been unwavering, really, for the last uh, 25 years. They've never really truly discussed any development uh, uh, towards peace. Um, they've always seen the Oslo Accords as a stepping stone to really gain initial power in Judea and Samaria and Gaza and then strive for the next move in that plan to destroy Israel. And, and nothing really has changed. That's the way they've been going all the way from the start. And and really, it's just the desire of, of, of the Western leaders to see, well, we want to see something moving. We want to see and really assume that the Palestinian leaders want that change. It's not listening to, 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 to even what is being said about the Palestinian Authority. It's just listen to their own words. Just listen to Mahmoud Abbas when he talks. Just listen to the other Palestinian leaders when they talk about the inalienable right of the Palestinian refugees, of, of, of all of Israel being Palestine. Um, these, are th these are subjects which have nothing to do with the Israeli government it's, it, it, or, or Israeli government policies. It's irrelevant whether a government policy says, you know what, we're willing to give a little bit more than, uh, um, than, than, than a previous government in, la in, in land swaps. If you remember, in, uh, um, uh, just a few years ago, um, Eld Olmert, as Prime Minister in Israel in 2008-2009, um, held talks with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. A few years later, Saeb Arakat, the, the, the chief negotiator, would say that Olmert offered Abbas more land than was included in the, in the, 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 the areas of Judea and Samaria before 1967, um, the, the land that was held, um, the West Bank, as it was called, um, by, the, by the Jordanians, and Gaza, Olmert offered him more land than, uh, 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 than, than was originally there. And Abbas 
still said no. He still mm. wasn't interested. It's nothing to do with the land. Is it anything to do with settlements? Absolutely not. Because it, for the Palestinians, it doesn't matter whether you're building a settlement in, for example, where I live, in Gush Etzion, eh, eh, where there's been a Jewish presence for 150 years, even before eh, 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 Israel was created. That's a settlement. That's what the, 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 the Jewish left possibly sees as the settlement, as the obstacle to peace. What the Palestinian Authority sees as a settlement, as an, as an obstacle to, to peace, is Herzliya, is Netanya, is Ashdod, is, 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 is Tel Aviv even. These are the settlements that are the obstacles for peace for the Palestinian uh, uh, Authority and, and nothing to do with, with, uh, 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 with even Hebron or, 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 or Ariel or, or, mm -hmm. or Gush Etzion. Yeah, that's an, I think that's a very important point um, because we're focused certainly um, in the United States on what Israel is supposedly doing wrong it supposed obstacles to peace in the form of settlements. But the end goal for the Palestinian Authority isn't really a negotiating tactic, is it? I mean, by codifying um, their demands for the return of the descendants of the 1948 refugees and for never recognizing the legitimacy of a Jewish state, no matter where its borders are drawn, it's really a zero-sum game for them, isn't it? It is, w w without a question, a zero-sum game for them. They uh, um, refuse to recognize the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. They see Jews as merely as a religion, not as a people. And if you're a religion, you're, on, you're not entitled to a state. That's their general approach. That by, by negating the, the nationhood of the Jewish people, they thereby also negate uh, uh, the right of Israel to exist. And that's in any borders, in every borders, because a religion doesn't deserve a country. They, they, they negate history. They rewrite history. I was just uh, talking recently about uh, um, the, the 1922 mandate for Palestine, which really opens with the, with the recognition of the international community for the historic connection of the Jewish people to the area of Palestine, to the, to, to the land of Israel. And, and recognizing its right to, to reconstitute its national homeland. Not to, to establish de novo, but really to reconstitute what already had existed. Um, and that's something which the Palestinians refuse to accept. Jews equals religion. Religion equals you can live anywhere. You have no right to a state. And therefore, we, the Palestinians, on the other hand, are a people of, of, of great historic background, Going back to, as they say sometimes, going back uh, uh, um, uh, to, to the start of mankind itself. Um, and, and, and therefore, we are the ones entitled to the national homeland. Um, history for them is, is something which is entirely subjective. Um, even objective uh, things uh, uh, um, that can be found um, are, are nothing more than an excuse and have been invented by the modern day Jews in order to to claim a history to historic Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely negating Jewish history. Um, you speak of the way the Palestinian Authority acts as the source for much of the disinformation um, being circulated about Israel in the West. Tell us about the way that Palestinian journalists play a part in this. Um, this is, the Palestinian media has gotten a lot of attention recently because of the death of Shireen Abu Alek, uh, Akleh. Um, a Palestinian American who was uh, who worked for Al Jazeera and who was killed during a battle between Israeli forces conducting a counterterrorism operation, um, and between them and Palestinian gunmen, it's not clear who whose bullet killed her. Um, how has her death helped further this effort to delegitimize uh, Israeli self-defense in Israel itself? Well, well, so that you have to see exactly how that how that story played out immediately. Mm -hmm. From the second that that Abu Akleh was, was, was killed, it was immediately Israel's fault. Obviously, Israel uh, um, had, had had executed uh, 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 Abu Akleh. Um, there was no idea that she could have been caught in a crossfire. Palestinians obviously never raised their weapons. The pictures of the Palestinian uh, terrorists indiscriminately firing down alleyways. Well, 
That's just a side issue, of course. That doesn't really happen. That's just propaganda put out by Israel. Um, they completely rewrite history, really the epitome of victimization all the way through. From the Palestinian Authority's point of view, when Palestinians are killed, they are always, always innocent victims. They are never referred to as fighters who went out to murder Jews. That's never said. They are always innocent victims. Although it's obviously clear that the Palestinians, or, 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 or there are very many Palestinian terrorists who, whose only goal is to carry out terrorism. And, and so that effort to rewrite, terror, rewrite history is something which is, which is constant all the time. Now, when you put into this the, the, the idea of the Palestinian media, and here, Jonathan, I have to make a, a, a distinction between Shireen Abu Akleh, who worked for Al Jazeera, and the rest of the Palestinian media. They're two very, very separate things. The Palestinian media, which we follow in Palestinian Media Watch, is something very, very foreign, I think, to most of the people who would ever listen to, uh, um, to our interview and to our discussion, because we come from Western countries. We assume that there is a free press, that, that what's written in the, in the press reflects the different opinions of different people, different sides, and, and really different arguments. In the Palestinian press, there is no such thing. In the Palestinian Authority, they have, similar to Pravda um, from the Soviet Union, they have the official press. The official press tells the official story. They have a newspaper, El Khayat al Jadida, funded by the Palestinian Authority. Its editor is appointed by the Palestinian Authority. The editorials, they say, represent the views of the Palestinian Authority. Everything that appears there is in, it, 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 it represents the ideas of the Palestinian Authority. The television is the same. It's entirely controlled by the Palestinian Authority. We have certain instances where we had live television, questions being asked, to the public and then suddenly someone in the public says asks a question which isn't to the liking of the Palestinian Authority and suddenly the, the, the broadcast is cut short amazingly. This is the level of control of the Palestinian media by the Palestinian Authority and so when you have this massive propaganda machine at your beck and call and it does and says exactly what you tell them to say then you, then you have a tremendous weapon that can be used both internally for the Palestinian consumption and also externally for foreign consumption when you have WAFA, the official news agency, which many Western sources will then rely on. Mm -hmm. They have to understand this is the mouthpiece of the Palestinian Authority. Information that is, that, that is carried by WAFA reflects only the views of the Palestinian Authority. And so journalism as a whole, as we know it from Western countries, is very different from the experience in the Palestinian Authority. Shirin Abu Akla was a, a journalist for, for, for Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera's hatred towards Israel is, 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 is I think, not even a, a, a question. But even they give their journalists a little bit more leeway mm -hmm. than, than the Palestinian Authority journalists have uh, um, to, to, to report the news. Yeah, it's it's really more propaganda, from the Palestinian media itself, it's propaganda, it's not journalism as we would know it. Um, one of the most obvious, although I think still puzzling, um, and least known facts about the Arab-Israeli conflict, at least among Americans, is that the Palestinian Authority has, as you alluded to earlier, rejected multiple offers of peace and statehood from Israel. Um, what do you think accounts um, for the pass that the PA gets about this, as well as its pay to slay policies and so much else? Is it just wishful thinking on the part of those who want to believe in the peace process, whether it's from inside the Jewish community or the foreign policy establishment here, um, even though it's been completely discredited by the Palestinians? Or do you think the influence of ideas like intersectionality and critical race theory that would categorize 
the Palestinians as um, oppressed people of color and Israel and the Jews as beneficiaries of white privilege is also playing a role here. How, how do you uh, sort of sort this out? I think it's predominantly, Jonathan, it's something which has existed for so long. Uh, um, it is clearly this idea of willful blindness. Once Yasser Arafat, in the name of the PLO, signed an agreement uh, um, declaring that the, 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 the PLO had abandoned its path to peace, uh, to, path to, uh, um, uh, to violence, and now was adopting and embracing this idea of peace with Israel, the Western countries have simply got stuck in that idea and really ignore everything the Palestinians do or say in order to promote that idea of creating this homeland for the Palestinian people as a separate idea from, from, from obviously from uh, Jordan, which is already predominantly Palestinian and historically was part of the, the, the mandate area called Palestine. And, and really that desire, constant desire to, to vilify Israel and to blame Israel for everything that's happening is something which I think is m a much more deep-seated feeling of, uh, 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 of almost anti-Semitism from the start. Nothing Israel can do can ever be sufficient. Um, the Palestine, no one ever asked in these European countries, well, between 1948 and 1967, when the West Bank, when Judea and Samaria was under Jordanian rule and Gaza was under Egyptian rule, why was no Palestinian state ever created then? Mm -hmm. No one asks that question. No one's interested in answering that question either. All they want to see is that Israel is responsible for the plight of the Palestinians and Israel is responsible for uh, its own as it were, white supremacy. I mean, look around Israel. It's as far as you can get from uh, white supremacy when you have uh, um, Jews from uh, Ethiopia who are far from being white, when you have uh, Jews come, who, 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 refugee families who escaped from the Arab lands in 1948, almost a million people, and made their way to Israel. They are far from white. They are just as much people of color as the Palestinians. Um, when you when you look at all these people and this idea of of of, of white privilege of of colonialism of well well where were the Palestinians um, where were the Arab countries in that period of 1948 to 1967 why does the uh, um, even the famous petition plan the uh, uh, resolution 181 of the UN from 1947 why does it not specifically discuss a Palestinian people? an Arab-only Palestinian people. We just uh, uh, recently saw a, a, a caricature um, with the picture on the one hand of, of the Mufti, Khaj Amin al-Husseini, uh, the, Palestin the Palestinian leader, as it were, who was uh, uh, um, so friendly with Hitler uh, and, and with the Nazis on, on, on one side of the caricature. On the other side, you had a Palestinian, a Jew saying, you're, you're not going to destroy us like you destroyed us in, in, in the concentration camps. This was a caricature carried in the New York Times in 1948. Palestinians in 1948 were Jews. There's a very famous YouTube video uh, um, that's running around of an interview of Golda Meir saying, I'm a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. but until 1948, Golda Meir, Israel's later, uh, uh, later prime minister, would held a Palestinian passport. When did this idea of a Palestinian, an Arab-only Palestinian, really come to fruition? Why even in Resolu UN Resolution 242, the end of the, 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 the Six-Day War and, and what the Palestinians would like to use as the, the, the basis for the demand that Israel retreat from the Palestinian territories, why does that resolution not mention the Palestinian people? Why does it not men mention the Palestinian territories? Because those ideas didn't exist. This is rewriting of history. This is ignoring clear historical documents in order to rewrite a narrative in which we implement our own modern day ideas. It, it has nothing to do with historical fact. It has nothing to do with 
historical rights. It has nothing to do with what actually the root causes of any of this conflict are. All it has to do is with this desire to vilify Israel on every and all account and to embolden the Palestinians in their goal to eventually destroy Israel. That, 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 that's what's being supported. Yeah, yeah. Um, isn't part of the problem with the Palestinian Authority the fact that both the United States and the state of Israel um, still, despite its faults, despite its being the main obstacle to peace, consider it a, an indispensable interlocutor and a better alternative to uh, Hamas, um, but also to Israel having to govern Judea and Samaria itself, um, and isn't, as it did before Oslo, isn't that why measures like the Taylor Force Act, which uh, links pay-to-slay uh, policies of the Palestinian Authority, don't get enforced, and Israel always seems to give, the, whoever is the government of Israel always seems to give uh, the PA, Fatah, some kind of a pass so it's able to keep going. Isn't that sort of what enables them uh, in the end to keep, you know, churning out this disinformation and keep uh, fueling the conflict? So, 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 so I think you're, 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 you're quite right on that point, Jonathan. For, for, for many years, it's, it's been clear that the Palestinian Authority, um, the PLO, is no longer a partner for peace. But the fear of Israel's governments already since, I think, 1995, 96, immediately after the Oslo Accords um, were signed, this, the, it's more of an expression of Israel's really never-ending desire to seek peace. As, 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 as much as Israel is vilified, um, Israel is truly seeking peace. We're looking for that, 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 that peace partner. We're always hoping that the Palestinian Authority, that Fatah will, will truly embrace this idea of peace. Just come to the realization, you're not going to destroy Israel. And once you find that leader who can say, you know what, I accept that and I'm willing to accept what Israel is offering, uh, um, that, that, that's something which Israel is striving for. And, and in the absence of any other, uh, um, any other true interlocker, that that's that's where Israel has been, and Israel's governments have been pushed. I would possibly argue, erroneously, by emboldening this idea of um, of, of of denying Israel's right to exist by allowing the PA to continue inciting and promoting and rewarding terrorism. We rarely, by our own hands, are, are, are extinguishing that, that, that flame of peace. And, and, and really, the, the idea isn't to, to destroy uh, um, the Palestinian Authority. It isn't to say, well, this whole project ha ha has died. It's just to uh, demand that we enforce what the Palestinians agreed to. They agreed to not incite. They agreed to not reward terrorism. They agreed to fight terrorism either, even. And that's something which Israel's government... We don't necessarily have to disband the PA. Just require the PA to meet its basic and standard requirements, um, and 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 so thereby open the door to peace. Um, the idea of, of of Hamas taking over the PA is something which is just ludicrous. This is an internationally recognized and designated terrorist organization, which in any other country its members would be uh, uh, chased and prosecuted and put in prison. But when it comes to Israel, so Israel is expected to accept all of what they call the Palestinian factions, including Hamas and the PFLP, another terrorist organization responsible for the recent murder of Rina Schnurb, uh, um, a 19-year-old uh, uh, Israeli girl, the, the 17-year-old Israeli girl, sorry. Uh, um, and, and these are things which, which the world chooses to ignore. But to an extent, Israel's really governments for the last 25 years have played into that narrative, agreeing that the Palestinian Authority should continue to exist, and in this never-ending, uh, um, almost blind desire to say, well, maybe they'll change, soon they'll change, it'll get better. And unfortunately, it just hasn't got better. Yeah, and they've got been given no incentive to get better, um, I think is, is uh, an important point. Um, I want to broaden our focus a little bit beyond what's going on in the territories and address why it is that Israel's enemies in international forums like the UN and among the so-called human rights community are so interested in the effort to um, 
brand and smear Israel as an apartheid state, perhaps even more than their desire to compare it to the Nazis. Um, as someone who yourself grew up in South Africa, I think we need to have it explained to us uh, more clearly just how absurd the apartheid claim is, but also why it is that that particular line um, is being taken by those who want to destroy Israel. So, so, so I think the answer, Jonathan, is very, very clear. The, apart, the anti-apartheid movement was seen to be a great success. Clearly, apartheid was bad. Oppressing black South Africans simply because of the color of their skin was inherently evil and bad. And, and the success of the international community really to, to get together, impose sanctions, and, and to really bring down the walls of apartheid is seen as something which the Palestinians want to emulate. And the human rights organizations are willing to really adopt that idea, excuse the word, rape the idea of apartheid and, 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 and apply it to Israel. When you're talking about apartheid, you're talking about black people in South Africa being banned from any type of representation in government, banned from holding certain jobs, banned from, from buying 93%, buying or renting, 93% of the land in South Africa, being forced to travel on separate buses, being forced to go to separate beaches, being forced to into separate schools. These are things which in Israel simply do not exist. They, they, they simply do not exist. And anyone who claims that is simply telling a lie. So what, what do the, 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 the human rights organizations and after them the UN uh, uh, um, bodies do? They alter the definition of apartheid in order to fit it into the, into, into the context of um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Obviously, Israel is oppressing the Palestinians because of their race. Well, that's just not true. There's nothing, to, there's nothing racial about, the, 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 about the, the, the conflict between Israel and, and, and the Palestinians. The Palestinians simply, as part of their ideology, want to completely destroy Israel and, 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 and create a Palestinian state from the river to the sea. The Jews just want to live. They just want to be able to have a country they can call their own in order to avoid the ramifications of, uh, uh, um, for example, the, the, the Holocaust. Um, we, we, we recently celebrated Israel's uh, uh, um, Independence Day. Independence Day in Israel is preceded by uh, uh, really a day of mourning for the victims, uh, for, 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 for our lost soldiers and for the victims of terrorism in, in Israel's wars. A week exactly before that, Israel has a, a um, Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, and 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 really the idea of those two uh, uh, um, Remembrance Days and Memorial Days coming together is very very clear. We mark the idea of losing our soldiers and the victims of terrorism in order to know what we have to pay to avoid a, 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 another Holocaust. Um, Israel and Jews can only be safe in, 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 in Israel's historic ancestral homeland. And that's something which we have to understand. The, the, the Palestinians, as I said before, don't see Israel's right to exist as a, as, as, as a people. And therefore, they see it only as a racial war, racial conflict between these Jews who see themselves as supremacists, a religion of, of supremacists, who are now imposing that supremacist idea and, 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 and really saying that Palestinians are inferior. There's nothing in Judaism that says that in any yeah. way, shape, or form. There's nothing in Israel's ideology that says that in, Israel, in any way, shape, or form. Palestinians are, as they see every uh, 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 Arab Israeli they see as Palestinians, we have, as opposed to South Africa, where there were no black uh, 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 South Africans on any of, Israel, or, or, of South Africa's courts, there are Arab, Israelis, Muslims in every one of the levels of Israel of Israel's courts. There was just, just recently a Muslim Arab appointed to Israel's Supreme Court. Um, the head of Bank Lumi is an Israeli Arab. Um, there are doctors, lawyers, policemen, even Israeli soldiers, Palestinians. The, the, the Palestinians call also Palestinians. They see themselves as proud Israelis, they're Muslims, 
They're Israeli Arabs, and they're serving in the Israeli Defense Forces because this is their country. And the Palestinians don't see that, and the human rights organizations that, that have really infiltrated, been infiltrated by, by anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic uh, leadership, have now given themselves over human rights watch, amnesty, who, who really took the definition of, of apartheid, realized that it was inappropriate for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and therefore just changed it, but said, but we'll continue to call this apartheid. It's Israeli apartheid. It's simply nonsense. But it's something which is so deep-seated, and everyone's already on that background, because the anti-apartheid movement succeeded in its goals, and rightly so. And so now that's what they're trying to do um, also to Israel, paint it in the colors of apartheid, and really try and persuade the world that Israel is the new uh, uh, South African uh, uh, apartheid regime. I think there's no question that um, uh, the apartheid uh, smear is a big lie. Uh, my question is, do Israelis uh, understand the damage uh, that the smears uh, of their country uh, is doing um, in various uh, international forums as well as in the United States? Um, or are they just for the most part, and perhaps understandably, just focused on managing the conflict, getting on with their lives in what is, after all, a very successful country, um, you know, an economic and, you know, regional military superpower, um, but not one, you know, but not focused at all on the way that these lies about Israel are serving to isolate it or perhaps eventually isolate it in international forums and undermine support in the United States as well. So I think we have to distinguish between uh, um, the average Israeli on the streets and, and, and some of the Israeli leadership. I think the average Israeli on the streets just doesn't care. Um, they appreciate that this is a, uh, uh, that these libels are, are nothing short of pure anti-Semitism. And, 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 and in their day-to-day -day life, when they interact with, uh, 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 with Arab Israelis, when they go to work with Arab Israelis, when they see the Arab Israelis in, in, in the pharmacies and in, and in hospitals and in, and in schools and everywhere, they, 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 they simply brush that off. Some of the leadership is, uh, um, is clearly minded to this idea that whilst the slur of apartheid and, 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 and these attacks on Israel are part of this concerted effort to, to really uh, uh, um, garner international support for implementing sanctions and, 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 and everything else against Israel. Um, I think to a, to, a, to a certain extent, the leadership is at almost at a loss as to what to do. I don't think we've seen anything um, done in the last, again, in the last 20, 30 years. I don't think it's limited to one government or the other in order to actively and effectively fight these slurs to a certain extent i'm not even sure if it's possible how do you fight the battle when you don't know what the next lie your victim your 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 supposed victims your your enemies are about to tell you don't know what's uh, where it's coming from when 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 the Palestinian Authority was, was depicting Israel as the spreaders of COVID-19. Well, how, how do you even deal with that? How do you anticipate that? How do you say, well, this is clearly just Jew hatred um, and, 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 and then try and move on. That, 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 there's nothing you can do about it. How do you explain to uh, the rest of the world that really in this area, there is an idea of apartheid? There is an idea of racial segregation, um, which is strictly enforced, but not against the Palestinians. Most Isra Jewish Israelis cannot go into 40% of Judea and Samaria, which is areas A and B under the Palestinian control, for fear of being murdered. You cannot travel on those streets. You cannot go into those areas and do shopping like we used to do. You cannot buy land because selling land to Jews, as we said earlier, it's not, there isn't even the 7% of land which the Palestinian Authority accepts can be sold as in uh, apartheid South Africa. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And that idea exists today. But 
and 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 so Israel's government uh, uh, governments really successive governments have been almost at a loss to understand how even international bodies can accept these slurs how intellectually you can accept the argument that Israel is an apartheid state how do you intellectually deal with that when you look around and see the diversity of Israel society see that there is no equivalence and yet still here human rights watch amnesty the hu- the the UN human rights council um dominated by dictators and 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 and, and human rights abusers saying well well israel is an obviously and clearly an apartheid country this is something which which how do, where do you even start that fight back how do you persuade uh, uh, um, even jewish americans wake up to what you're hearing look around at jewish and israeli society visit israel and see that there are no separate buses for arabs there are no uh, um, separate hospitals just for uh, for Arab. This is something that is an integral part of. <coughs> excuse me. This entire slur is not a small dose of just pure ignorance. Unfortunately, even on the part of uh, uh, um, Jewish Americans who who refuse to see that reality, who refuse similar to Israel's government, who have refused to accept the fact that there's only one place in the world where you're actually paid a financial reward for murdering Jews. Imagine that, Jonathan, what, what, what all these uh, movements, what would Black Lives Matter do if someone was to, if, if a government were to implement a system where you get paid a financial reward for every black person you murder? Clearly, this there, there would be tremendous outrage. How can that possibly even be thought about? And yet, when it comes to the Palestinian Authority, left-wing Jews refuse to accept that, that that's the situation. Ahmed Manasra is receiving a salary because he murdered Jews. He wasn't a breadwinner. Mm-hmm. The Palestinian terrorists who were involved in the 2015 uh, uh, war, who 50% were under the age of 15, were not breadwinners for their families. Why are they receiving salaries? From my experience in, in my previous uh, uh, um, uh, uh, professional capacity, I was head of the prosecution for, for Judea and Samaria. Um, 70% of the terrorists are single. They mm-hmm. were not breadwinners. The payments to terrorists are rewards for terrorism. There isn't, they have nothing to do with social welfare. How can left-wing Jews in America not see and accept just that reality? We can talk about land for peace. We can talk about this idea. We can discuss the idea whether they accept it, whether Israeli governments accept it, how much has been offered, how much has been offered. Accept one thing. The Palestinian Authority incentivizes and rewards murdering Jews. That's something which needs to sink in. And then by that, you understand who you're then dealing with. Yeah. I'd like to sort of in, in conclusion, I'd like to ask you, 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 your work and that of Palestinian Media Watch focuses on the lies being told um, by the Palestinians, by their uh, enablers and apologists. Um, But you've been doing this job of getting the truth out. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the truth breaking through in the West and exposing these lies? I mean, the truth is out there. Um, Do you feel more people are listening to it? Or do you think the Palestinians are still gaining ground in, in that respect? Well, so if we look at just one factor, Jonathan, I think the, 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 there is actually is quite a, a, a substantial uh, um, amount of hope. Um, the one factor, if we look at it, is international funding for the Palestinian Authority. Um, international funding for the Palestinian Authority has dropped since 2011, since Palestinian Media Watch exposed this pay-for-slay policy um, through 2021 by 90 percent um for the last year and a half even the european union has been holding up its its donations to the palestinian authority because of the content of 
the Palestinian school books. This is a subject also raised by, by Palestinian Media Watch over the years, uh, um, and, and, and others have also joined in that, in, in, in that fight. Uh, Impact SC being one of the, really one of the, 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 the leading organizations, if not the leading organization um, dealing with that now. And this idea of Taylor Force on the one hand, the uh, um, stopping American aid to the PA until they abolish, pay for slay. Um, a similar legislation was passed in, in, in Holland as well. Many other countries without pa passing legislation have refused to fund the PA's general budget. There is recognition. I think there are inroads being made. It's very slow. Everyone still wants to see the reforming of the Palestinian Authority in order to help the Palestinian people. Um, and, and from mm -hmm. that point of view, I think there is not a small amount of, 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 of hope and of optimism. Unfortunately, there's also not a small amount of pessimism and, 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 and acceptance of reality. None of uh, um, the international community um, are really calling out the Palestinian leadership for their Jew hatred, are really calling out the Palestinian uh, Authority and demanding that they accept Israel's right to exist. Um, these major stones, um, foundation stones in the, the, the path forward to peace are, are, are being neglected by the international community. And as long as the international community, as you said, the apologists and the enablers continue giving the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership a free pass, peace will never be achieved. By ignoring the malfeasance of the Palestinian Authority, we will never achieve peace. Yeah, I think that's and, a, yeah, and so that's something which has to be accepted also by the international community, which they seem very reluctant to the point of refusing to see the clear reality that that that, that, that that's there. Yes, well, I think that's a very important point. You've given us so much, uh, um, so much information, and a lot of important points that I think need to be emphasized. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us, Maurice. Um, it's been great. We also want to thank our audience, uh, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms or watching us live on Facebook or on Twitter or on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story and give us good reviews. Please let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself. And we'll see you again next week.